This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. As futurists, we love to think about the technologies that will enhance the lives of our distant descendants. It's easy to forget though that there will be some pretty amazing technologies we'll actually live to see. While the show tends to spend a lot of its time in the far future, today we'll be looking at technologies more on the near horizon, from automated vehicles to improvements in medicine, to space technologies and many more. Indeed, many many more, so you'll definitely want to grab a drink and a snack for this one, as we'll be here for quite a while. To cut down on a few of these topics, we've discussed a few of these technologies in greater length before, so we'll be putting up thumbnails of various related videos as we go. They're all going to be more than YouTube lets me add in-video card links for, so we'll add those we can't include in the video to the episode description. We'll also be hitting a lot of other topics that probably deserve their own episodes, so we'll run a poll over on our community tab for some of those, and see which one most of you would like to see us cover in more detail. Also as we go through these, beyond discussing what the tech is, I'll try to give a guess about how far off it is and what sort of impacts it might have on our civilization. It's worth noting that big shiny awesome technologies often don't have as big an impact as something much more subtle, as we noted back in the episode Quiet Revolution. Stuff like Amazon's online marketplace or Uber's crowdsourced approach to taxi cabs isn't the stuff of science fiction novels, but often has far more impact on society than a deeper theoretical knowledge of cosmology or particle physics does. Just to give an example, self-driving cars seem pretty neat, but it's really more its impact on stuff like freight vehicles that would heavily alter our economy. Very few folks realize what a large sector of our economy freight is, but the job of truck driver is the most common job in 29 states of the United States. Retail sales are still larger by about a million people, but automated self-checkouts and online shopping are impacting that. Both truckers and cashiers are quite likely to go the way of the milkman in the next generation, The impact they will have on freight and retail is vast, good and bad, as every item we buy has to factor in the cost of paying a driver to take those goods to the store, and either a cashier at the store or a delivery man to bring the merchandise to your home. Remove or decrease those and everything gets cheaper, and folks can buy more things to improve their lives, items which are also likely gotten cheaper. But that's hardly the sole impact, even ignoring the massive job displacement. Early automated vehicles may well have dedicated lanes on large freeways, similar to the carpool lane, and indeed automated vehicles are ideal for carpooling in modern times, in an Uber-esque way, since each person can enter their pickup and destination time and location into a service and computers can near instantly plot the optimum way to have many vehicles pick up many more people. It will be quite some time before many folks will be willing to abandon owning a car personally, automated or not, depending on their preferences and needs, however there would be many more folks who decide such an automated pickup and transport was a better option, and many other folks who could rent out their car to services providing it were not using it themselves, and far fewer families that felt the need for multiple cars. It also would indirectly impact residential housing. The attached multiple car garage on many houses might be less common and we might see a lot of existing ones convert to other uses, and large driveways may also disappear. Garages in turn might find themselves being converted into externally accessible delivery bins that open on a signal from an authorized delivery person or robot. There's a rising problem with folks snatching packages off other people's porches as we have more and more deliveries, and secure drop-off containers for packages, possibly including insulated or refrigerated ones for groceries, are things I'd expect to see become rather common in dwellings in the years to come. It would be very easy for each house and its container to have its dimensions and characteristics, catalogs so all these new distribution managers could say in advance what could be safely delivered to them or picked up from them. Of course a lot of this delivery tech might be interrupted by improvements in 3D printing, as some products might be delivered to your home in the form of data, and printed on the spot, or we may even have roving printing and delivery trucks for some items. See the episode The Santa Claus Machine for more discussion of the uses and challenges of advanced 3D printing, or our episode Synthetic Meat for a discussion of printing steaks at home, rather than getting them delivered from a long supply chain originating from a cow. Another one of those tiny techs that would be better automated is cataloging. Smartphones or internal sensors would monitor where all your junk was and tagged it, 
and you just slap a barcode or RF sticker on it from some cheap roll of stickers and scan the object while seeing what it was. Assuming most products don't come with such things built into them to help with the inventory at stores, which could be used at home too. The follow up on that would be optimizing software that suggested and displayed ideal packing of everything from your attic to your refrigerator, based on minimizing space and maximizing easy access to regularly used objects, and potentially also telling you stuff like, based on attic or basement temperature and humidity changes, this object should not be stored here or the following food items in your pantry or refrigerator are nearing their expiration date. AI might go even further and recommend lifestyle changes based on your eating, shopping, and other habits, a problem we're already facing with private data collection today. You can get tiny little impacts too, like local charity food pantries getting an influx of canned goods as people get alerted to things near their shelf life, decide they don't feel like eating it that week, and just toss it into one of their delivery bins while flagging it for a donation. The next delivery person or bot grabs it, and then it makes its way to a food pantry, less waste, less cost, less hassle, a small thing but also a big one too. In the same way you might auto eBay objects you no longer want, just stick it in the bin and say sell me, and it goes up for a remote auction, you get part of the sale and you never worry about it again. Better household robots might help with a lot of that too, easily picking up your trash or clothes or personal effects and disposing, cleaning, or storing them with no further thought. That's a bit more complicated than our robot mops and vacuums we are starting to see become regular household appliances, but not too much so. Since this episode is premiering in the spring when folks are returning to their lawns and gardens, it's worth a segue onto that topic. We can expect to see a big boom in robot lawnmowers, I suspect for 2030 you will see a huge drop off in manual lawnmower sales, with most remaining manual lawnmowers and households being old or used and slowly becoming a niche market. You can expect the same for snowblowers and many other easily automated tasks like trimming, fertilizing, edging, and aerating, not because every household would necessarily need to own one either, but because one such robot could probably serve many households. It will be interesting to see if this sector of rentable automated lawn maintenance robots will be in the form of businesses renting them out, or more of the crowdsourced Uber approach of local owners and some app or company that buys it for the downtime. This need not necessarily be limited to robotic equipment either, but various more expensive tools folks need not very often. After all, for something like a snowblower, even in the winter they spend most of their time shut off, but if the snow is coming down it's nice to have forced dibs on its use by owning it personally however you can then rent it out to others. Other items see even more infrequent and time dependent use, 20 or 30 people in a town of several hundred might own a lawn aerator robot, something you only use a few days a year, and as the market develops you see a lot of folks who buy it for the novelty and decide to make some extra cash when the device isn't in use. It's also good for ecological reasons too, healthy lawns that are maintained and fertilized on proper and accurate schedules save a lot of water and fertilizer and decrease a lot of runoff issues we have with that. You also might see a drop off in lawns in favor of more complex gardens if robots are handling most of the grunt work, be they strictly ornamental or food producing gardens. Better digital mapping of lawns is also something I'd expect. It's nice if your fertilizer robot knows the type of tree it's meandering by and its mass, so it can fertilize appropriately, but it's also handy to homeowners and agencies to be able to see when a tree needs to be trimmed or brought down to minimize the risk to houses and power lines. Of course we're also seeing improvements in boring technology that might see burying lines and many other utilities get far easier, cheaper, and more common. One other example of unexpected business impacts before we move on to more technology, insurance companies may see a decline in claims, and consumers in their premiums, from all this automation. We won't use self-driving cars much until they are demonstrably safer than the average driver, let alone those who are inexperienced or under the influence, which is where a vastly disproportionate number of car wrecks come from. So too, more home and lawn automation and computerization is likely to see all sorts of house damage decrease in frequency or severity. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as the saying goes, and we'll be seeing this more and more in medicine. DNA testing is now dirt cheap and I expect it to become near universal by 2030, even if it's the insurance companies paying for it. There's just so many illnesses that can be prevented or mitigated with advanced warning when someone is predisposed to them genetically and many illnesses that can be cured or mitigated by early warning through detection. 
When I was a kid, the MRI machine had just been invented a few years earlier by Raymond Dominion. As they became cheaper and better, they have saved many, many lives, not to mention much hardship. With improvements to them, the software running on them, and the cost of making them, we might expect to see full body scans at even better resolution than now be a routine part of an annual physical. However, we've also seen the Fitbit and parallel devices become quite common in the last few years, and I expect they'll get even more widespread in their use and uses. Laser imaging, constant tracking of heart rate and blood pressure, and possibly many other blood related bits of data may result in someone's smartphone being able to build a ridiculously accurate day by day or even minute by minute medical log of those, sleep cycles and other biological cycles, weight, body fat, calories in and out, and an ever growing catalog of relevant health information that could be automatically analyzed and forwarded to your doctor or export AI. There's another sector that might see some drop off. As equipment for medicine and delivery improves, we might see a lot of medical tests performed by technicians we often get a couple weeks before our physicals be something done at home. How tricky might be a bracelet that could image for an artery or vein and grab a quick blood sample for pickup and transport to a lab for analysis. I'd not expect too much of that in the next decade, but probably within a generation, two at most, we'd see a lot less routine trips to the doctor for preventative medicine while at the same time having vastly more preventative medicine. That's the sort of thing that could have a huge impact on the health sector, when the vast majority of ailments are detected almost immediately and at home. AI could also have a major impact on these jobs, as some things like analyzing a bone for a fracture can be performed far more accurately by software than by a human. Needless to say, improvements of nanotechnology in medicine would be beyond helpful, as would various types of cybernetics or mind-machine interfaces like we've looked at in our cyborgs, mind augmentation, and mind-machine interfaces. And we are seeing major developments in all those now, not just in the pages or scripts of science fiction anymore. I suspect we'll also see far more improvements in things like gene therapy, cancer treatment, and life extension. Indeed as we discussed in Life Extension and Science of Aging episodes, all medicine is life extension technology, a favorite quote of mine by my friend Aubrey de Grey of Sens Research Foundation. As folks continue to live longer and healthier lives, they can enjoy a far larger percentage of their life being economically productive, which would doubtless see some major impacts on those sectors of the economy centered on children or the elderly. If you join the workforce at 25, retire at 65, and die at 80, you get 40 years of work, 50% of your life. If you live to 100 and are as productive at 85 as at 65, then you get 60 years of work, 50% more, and can work for 60% of your life, 20% more. But you're gaining more skills every day. What's more, if we assume a stable population of zero growth for the moment, averaging 100 years to keep it easy, A kid in K-12 is only spending 13% of their life getting state-funded education and 60% of their life paying taxes for that education, as opposed to the earlier example where they retired at 65 and died at 80, 60% of their life getting schooled and 50% paying taxes for it. That's literally 50% more production versus education time for the longer life meaning you could spend 50% more on education, or 25% more for it, and 25% in lower taxes or educating people longer. Of course that was assuming people are as productive, but in a high skill workforce, more experience often means more productivity, so it's likely even better than that 50% increase we just calculated. Of course you often have to retrain people as technology and industry changes, which is no easy thing as we found, not to mention train them in the first place, and education technology is the next big one we'll discuss. College has become rather more common than it was when I went, and certainly when I was born, and even then it was pretty common compared to the mid 20th century. There is a feeling among many that we've reached peak college, about the maximum percent of folks who are attending university, and I kind of agree. I will say outright, I think the number of degrees and the value of those degrees to those getting them has dropped sharply, and I have some rather pointed views on our colleges I'll keep to myself, but I don't think we'll see a drop off in folks getting more education, quite the opposite in fact. I do think we'll see a drop off in physical university attendance, and a slower but sharper drop in tuition the next few decades as we see more and more online schools arising and being seen as more valuable than they currently are. 
but it's also worth mentioning trade schools or on-the-job training will likely come back around, as the need for a workhorse specifically oriented to maintaining robotics and AI increases. Needless to say, I'd like to see improvements in teaching technology, we've discussed before some options like a computer that models a student's interest in something they are reading by scanning their eyes and vital data, to switch to an alternate example or zoom in on a topic that piqued their interest, or sensing they are growing frustrated with a problem and summoning a teacher. However, the use of artificial intelligence in learning can't be underestimated. If you can track a student's progress individually and far more accurately on each topic, or even how they respond to certain teachers or styles, we can better match them up and also hopefully cut back on standardized exams, which so often leads to teaching to the test, which is unsurprisingly rather unpopular with everyone, even those who view it as the best option, or least worst, for evaluating performance of students, teachers, and schools. The use of artificial intelligence in administrative roles and the impact of that cannot be downplayed either. While we principally think of robots for drudge work or giant factories, even relatively simple AI can do wonders for clerical and administrative tasks. Computerization has always seen more use in offices than factories anyway, but just use that example from a moment ago, of a computer monitoring a student's vitals to track mood and engagement, the same software can be used at workplaces to help allot work tasks to those who enjoyed them and perform them better, which tends to be synonymous. From a managerial standpoint, if you can go in and see who does what best and likes it most at a very accurate and detailed level, you know who to assign to what and who to promote or fire, or who to put on shift together. You can shift things around for ideal performance if you have data showing folks in good or bad moods around a given coworker or superior. The same applies to stuff like online dating too, since anytime you have vast amounts of data on folks, it's much easier to build a true and accurate profile of what they like or dislike. Arguably even better than they could say themselves, since even ignoring lying, we often aren't consciously aware of a lot of our preferences and irritations. I'd imagine few dating websites would have a performance mark for people who can't stand it when someone else chews with their mouth open or tends to click pens or tap their fingers. But if you're monitoring folks all their life though, stuff like that could be included in an algorithm that filtered folks from each other for such minor but deal-breaking quirks. We looked at some of the more interesting, amusing, and disturbing scenarios for the future of dating and relationships in the episode Happily Ever After. It's a bit disturbing, to say the least, to think about being monitored and analyzed all the time, but it does come with many advantages and AI opens the door to it maybe being much more private. It's easier to put safeguards on an AI spilling personal data to people, and presumably they aren't prone to gossip or bribes. Telepresence deserves a quick mention too. We'll be seeing a lot more remote work in years to come, but that's not just a matter of convenience but also safety. Robots will be working dangerous jobs or in space or on the moon, especially ones incorporating a small amount of AI for mundane work and remote access for more detailed hazardous or irregular tasks. Limited AI and telepresence will blend together wonderfully in robots, we can get quite an impressive operating suite into something ambulance sized these days, and if we've got remote cars we can have remote ambulances too. Even ignoring more high tech robots, if a paramedic, police officer, firefighter, or other first responder with basic medical skills can have a remote ambulance arriving rapidly, they can provide very impressive care with the aid of a telepresent doctor or surgeon. Such things will have huge impacts on medicine, which we just mentioned, but also on stuff like crime. It's much harder to commit crimes when there are records of pretty much everywhere someone has been, and it's pretty hard to mug someone if they can summon help with a single tap and police can instantly activate every street camera nearby and potentially requisition or subpoena feeds from other folks' phones who are identified as being in the area and then run facial recognition on the perpetrator, or even just monitor them as they flee. They might be actively pursued by drones as well, many officers are injured by foot chases either by accident or ambush, and of course they might not be as fast as whoever they are pursuing. A drone can help a lot with that, and potentially include a taser. See the episode Attack of the Drones for more discussion of those options. That kind of criminal surveillance tends to assume cameras or sensors on public roads, but this is another thing I figure will be ubiquitous within 10 to 20 years and part of our next technology to discuss, which is smart cities. This isn't even a thing of the future or modern times, administrating cities with technology predates even things like traffic lights, 
Strictly speaking, even everyone just becoming literate made navigating via maps and road signs much easier in large cities, but traffic lights that can detect how much traffic is waiting or even approaching helps a lot, as do navigation maps and tracking systems that can warn of traffic jams and reroute, or simply be analyzed for what bits of road most urgently need repair or expansion. Cities are proverbial for the traffic jams but advances in such things, automated vehicles and better public transport might make those a thing of the past even in the most dense cities. Needless to say, AI can help a lot with your power, water, and communication grids too, but we also have a lot of technology for power on the horizon. Fusion might genuinely be 20 years away, as we discussed in Fusion Power, and beamed energy might be on the horizon too, as we looked at in Power Satellites. But photoconductive graphene and perovskite solar panels might allow massive cheap printing of solar panels, one so cheap and thin we could use them as casually as wallpaper. You don't need advanced metamaterials or hyper-efficient batteries to help with power if you've got dirt cheap solar, though we're seeing tons of improvements in both. The Diamond Battery is a weak nuclear battery that runs on beta decay of carbon-14, and could last thousands of years while providing a small but safe, ultra sturdy and compact power source. It may well enter regular use before too long, meaning you never need to replace batteries on many devices. See the Metamaterials and Portable Power episodes for all the exciting developments and options there. We also have Classic Nuclear Fission too, which has seen tons of improvements. We looked at space-based nuclear a lot in our Nuclear Option episode and in our recent episode Moon Industrial Complex. While thorium is a tempting and much talked about option, uranium molten salt nuclear reactors offer a lot more promise for near-term, safe, cheap, and massive power production. Modern nuclear reactors in general don't need to be far from cities, they are indeed quite safe, but one of the big hurdles for nuclear power is the fear of it. Molten salt reactors are safer, and other types of new, safe designs like very small, high temperature, gas-cooled reactors could allow for their use in everyday manufacturing plants that need lots of heat production, like metal smelting or water desalination. However, we probably still tend to site nuclear reactors in rural or remote areas anyways. Part of the problem with the power grid is that you need to be able to carry power long distances with little loss, and indeed a large portion of existing power generation is lost as heat just going through our wires. If we can develop room temperature superconductors, that problem is totally eliminated, and you can also start moving power over any distance with little to no loss, allowing the sunny side of the planet to power the dark side for instance, or your deserts to power your cold and cloudy areas, or your big wind or hydro or geothermal plants to pick up that slack far away from where they are. Assuming we remain resistant to nuclear fission and don't get fusion or power satellites, and I'm hoping that wall will break on at least one of those in the next couple of years or decades, because abundant safe power is something that we need badly and that would benefit us in a thousand economic sectors. Room temperature superconductors may elude us forever, but if they can be made, they likely will be found within this generation, and we've been having a lot of luck with very recent work in two-dimensional materials like graphene and molybdenum diselenide and research on what's called magic angle orientation of those nanoparticles. Superconductivity, however, is a topic that requires a bit too much discussion to go into in any detail today, and we're definitely overdue to give it its own episode. Of course advanced geothermal energy production might get easier soon too. Normally geothermal power relies on heating water to turn turbines, and that might benefit a lot from improvements in boring technology, allowing us to drill those holes and lay those pipes deeply underground for much cheaper. However, we also have a device called a thermocouple that is basically a metal rod that produces electricity if one end is hotter than the other. These things aren't terribly efficient, but they are ridiculously cheap and sturdy, so one that was basically a long rod hammered into the ground would be nice for power if it was simply more efficient and certain materials called scutterodites are showing promise in allowing thermocouples that might be efficient enough to make them a realistic option for commercial power generation. I suspect most of us would rather like the idea of our power and heating or cooling supply being a big rod in our basement, rather than something that has to be brought in by wire, pipe, or transmission from afar. So if that did become economical, it might become preferred or at least take on the role of a backup power generator or supplement. Residential power production is having a major impact on infrastructure already, 
along with other technologies like water collection or waste recycling or the like, which makes going off-grid more tempting for many rural folks. Of course you'd still need roads to those places, or maybe not. It's an old complaint that people often wonder where the jetpacks and flying cars are that science fiction promised them way back, and same as we might see drones doing a lot of deliveries in the future, that is actually technology that can be scared up for people too. I should also note that one of the reasons we don't use a lot of blimps and dirigibles is because it's so hard to keep lifting gases like hydrogen and helium from leaking out, as they are atoms smaller than the material containing them usually. However, pristine graphene is impermeable to these gases, so we may see some big improvements in quadcopters and gas containment that might allow some safe and affordable flying vehicles to finally hit the commercial marketplace, and maybe sooner than later. We've talked a lot about automated supply and manufacturing, and while the self-replicating robot is often seen as very sci-fi, this is one I expect we'll have in the next 10-20 to years too. Probably not as a tiny nanobot, though maybe, but more likely as what we call a clanking self-replicator, which is more of a large-scale automated factory. If you've got enough automation in your supply and manufacturing, you arguably already have a self-replicating machine even if bits and pieces of it occupy 10,000 factories and mines and freight vehicles. There's also nothing special about one that requires no human involvement. We want such devices because of the vast amount of production they represent and their ability to exponentially grow that production as they make more of themselves. That's not really hindered, except for deep space or interstellar purposes, by having humans as a small but necessary component of that self-replication. Indeed it's arguably a nice safeguard against various machine rebellion or paperclip maximizer scenarios. Machines make things cheaper than people do, but are often themselves expensive to make too, when they are self-replicating in whole or part, and building their own power sources too, most of your cost is now simply design, and so many things would become dirt cheap at that point, much as how the cost of steel or aluminum in the past made things like railroads or skyscrapers impractical not because they were great engineering hurdles, but were simply too expensive to produce, and then suddenly were not. With sufficient manpower or sufficient production, virtually any task can be accomplished through raw effort, even the building of vast megastructures. If the machines do most or all of that effort, including mostly making themselves, the game changes on everything, and that game may change in a mere generation, giving us unbelievably immense production and work capacity. As we say here on SFIA, if brute force isn't working, you're not using enough of it. And soon, we may have more than enough of it. It's always hard to predict when new technologies will roll out and how quickly they catch on. For instance, as usual I wrote and recorded the script some months before it aired and predicted how we'd see a lot more deliveries of groceries and remote work and learning. I was thinking the boom in that would be in a decade or so, and with the current health crisis I'm inclined to revise that as happening a bit faster now. Every storm has its silver lining, and we might see a lot of preventative health monitoring we'd mentioned today develop sooner along with being able to use people's phone positioning data to help rapidly track and contain outbreaks, as we could simply compare their times and positions to other folks to see who might have been exposed, and alert them. Things like that raise privacy concerns that could be addressed in many ways, both by policy and technology, but one way to do that effectively, rapidly, and privately might be employing artificial intelligence using neural networks, a rapidly growing area as neural networks are far better at prediction and decision making than classic computers. If you're interested in learning more about neural networks, there's a great course on it from Brilliant, which offers extensive but plain English and interactive learning methods for that topic and many more. If you'd like to enhance your own understanding of science and do it from the comfort of your own home and at your own pace, or have family members who need to do the same, then Brilliant is a great match. Brilliant is an online learning community with over 60 interactive courses and many quizzes and puzzles, plus fun daily challenges that help get the brain warmed up for the day. Those challenges provide a context and framework that you need to tackle so that you learn the concepts by applying them, which is the best way to learn new concepts. Brilliant makes learning fun and easier, and their online community gives you places to discuss the material or ask questions, and their mobile apps offline feature lets you take courses even when you're not getting a good signal. If you'd like to learn more science, math, and computer science, go to brilliant.org slash and sign up for free 
and also the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription so you can solve all the daily challenges in the archives and access dozens of problem solving courses. Today we were looking at technologies coming up in the near future and how hard it is to predict when breakthroughs will be made, so next week we'll look at what might happen if no more breakthroughs are made in technological stagnation. The week after that we'll be exploring the idea of life not based on normal organic chemistry or even carbon at all, as we look at the idea of non-carbon based life and the stranger life that it might be and the stranger locations we might find it. If you want to alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes you can visit our website, IsaacArthur.net, to donate to the channel, check out our catalog of episodes or book recommendations, or buy some awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.